Hi everyone and welcome to Perth South Model Railway and a very belated Happy New Year to everyone. During the summer I fitted coloured light signals to the lower level of the layout. This is a short video explaining how I went about it. I mentioned previously that there were two reasons for fitting signals to this non-scenic section. I wanted to prove that my concept worked for the control of signals. Second, when running trains manually in between computer operated trains, you have to obey their signals just as per prototype. And while the signal aspects are shown on the switchboard and on on-screen throttles, I can envisage in future we'll have tiny cameras in each train and you can drive them round the layout like a real train driver. So I decided to fit the signals to the low level before moving on to the upper scenic level. On the prototype Perth station, the area had been re-signalled with colour lights in 1962, just before the period I am modelling, so I only require colour light signals on the layout, and most of these are three aspect rather than four aspect. There are three parts to this video. First, the signals. Secondly, the digital method of powering them. And thirdly, the computer logic that decides which aspect to display. Firstly, the signals. These are all three aspect Berco or their kit equivalent econ signals with a square edged backplate available from online models. These are good authentic models and are good value at around £10 for a three aspect signals. signal. They're electrically very simple with separate wires feeding the red, yellow and green aspects and could essentially be controlled by on off switches or a three way rotary switch if you wanted to control them manually. However, I wanted to control them digitally and that leads us to the second part of the video, the power and digital switching of these signals, which is controlled by Digitrax XSE8C accessory decoders. Each of these units can drive eight slow motion switch machines and 32 three aspect signals. So although they cost about £105 each, they can control a lot of points and signals. So this is the SE8C unit, the power input and the outputs to point motors are through the blue edge connector strip. The digital instructions to this decoder come in through the Loconet cable, which is daisy chained to other electronic units. And the output to the signals is via this, um, this 10 10 core cable uh, through eight ports on the unit. Now each of these sockets can power four signals and there's eight of these so four eights 32 three aspect signals. Two or three aspect signals. Digitracks produce small n-scale US style twin headed signals which have the 10 pin plug to fit the socket in the cable. The plug includes appropriate resistors, something you must always use with LEDs. However, for UK practice, we cut off the signal mast and then solder wires in to connect to our own signals so that each plug controls two separate signals. I put a connector strip in between the plug and signals to ease the, the final wire connections. The grey tape that you see in the picture uh, is just to protect the very delicate wires that are soldered to the, uh, to the plug. Now by clever use of wires and pins, Digitrax have designed this so that by turning the plug round 180 degrees, you get a further set of signal addresses meaning each length of cable can control four three-aspect signals. There are a couple of changes you need to make to the option settings of the SEHC to adapt it for UK practice. Firstly, change for Euro European style common cathode LEDs rather than American common anode ones. 
Secondly, change an option for steady yellow rather than flashing yellow used in the USA. Charlie Bishop and his channel did a, a video demonstrating how to do this option switching, so I won't repeat it here, but I have included a link to Charlie's video if you're interested. So the digital address of the red and green aspects of this signal are 299. So I can change it using uh, this hand controller by pressing switch 299 and throw is red, closed is green. 299, throw, red, closed is green. Address 300, and if I press throw, we get the yellow aspect. Go back to 299, throw, red, close, green. If I press 300, try again. If I press 300, throw again, it goes to yellow. And 300 closed is actually a blank aspect. But that's okay because we don't use 300 closed, just 300 thrown. You can only use a set list of digital addresses for each SE8C. And you move from one set of addresses to another by resetting uh, the board number on the SE8C. So you can't choose signal numbers um, willy-nilly, so to speak. You have to go by the fixed uh, ranges that are allowed for in the SEHC. So you, you do have to be careful that you don't have other accessory decoders with the same digital addresses. However, I wanted the signals to work automatically in line with routes set for train movements. And that brings us to the third part of the video, which is the use of train controller to provide the logic of which signal aspect to display. Following prototype practice, I wanted controlled signals and automatic signals. Controlled is where the signal is normally read and only changes to a proceed aspect when the signaler, or in my case, the computer sets the route. And an example of controlled signals are these ones here, where there's an option of, of which route to take. An automatic signal is one usually in long stretches of plain line where the signal is normally green and changes to red and then yellow and green as a train passes. And for instance, this signal here is designed to be an automatic one because there's nothing but plain line uh, ahead of that signal. Train controller allows us to create accessory signals to which we can apply the actual digital addresses of the signals on the layout. Uh, these are examples of accessory signals that I've added to the switchboard. And if I double click um, on one of these items, um, then we can see we come up with the dialog editing box. Um, and if I click on connection, it shows that this signal has a uh, red green address of 469 and a secondary address for the yellow aspect of 470. We can then add triggers and conditions which will cause the correct aspect to be displayed. The key things that determine a signal aspect are are the routes are the or are, are all the points set for the correct route? Is the section or block ahead clear of trains? And what is the aspect of the next signal ahead in the direction of travel? The first item is checked using routes and train controller. Every two adjacent blocks are connected by routes, which includes all the sets of points. If a, a route is activated, all the points are set correctly for that route. For instance, if I set up a route from um, hidden siding uh, UH6 to reverse north by clicking, first of all, that button 
and then this button. The route is set up and all the signals are set appropriately. Route DH5 to reverse north uses a lot of the same points, thus activating a particular route either manually or automatically will set all the required points. The second item is the route ahead clear of trains is, is checked using the BDL-168 occupancy detectors to advise train controller whether or not the block ahead and the route leading there is free of trains. Now in this case, looking at the diagram, uh, although the route is activated, there are no trains on it because it would be showing red if there was a train on the route and the block is also clear. Uh, any blocks occupied are shown in a, a pink colour, although you can set these colours to your own preference. The third item is checked by looking at the current aspect of the signal at the end of the next block along the line. So in this case, the next block which is the reverse loop, the signal is red, so the signal in the preceding block is yellow. Thus a typical trigger for a controlled signal would look like this. Now if I go to edit mode, we double click on this signal again. So for green, these represent the various um, occupancy detectors and this is saying that for the signal to be green then these various um, sections of occupancy must be uh, must not be occupied by a train. This symbol here represents the route and says that the route from uh, siding UH6 to DM1 uh, must be um, must be active and that DM1 North must not be red. Um, the alternative route which is the one that's shown here into reverse north uh, shows that the reverse north uh, occupancy must be clear, that uh, the route to, U U to, to reverse north must be activated and that the signal at the end of reverse north must not be read. Now in actual fact that can't happen in this case. Um, the uh, signal at the end of re reverse north will always initially be read um, so it's unlikely that we would ever get a green going into uh, the reverse north block. We would however get it uh, going towards DM1 which is this signal here. Uh, for a yellow aspect um, the triggers are much the same. Uh, we have to have a valid route which is activated. The occupancy detectors must show there's no train. The black colour indicates there's no train occupying them. But in this case for a yellow aspect the signal at the end of the block must be red. So DM1 would be red to cause this signal to be yellow uh, if the route was set that way. Um, as we're going to uh, into reverse north, then the reverse north signal is red. Um, the occupancy is unoccupied. The route is activated uh, by the, the yellow markings. That means it's active. And therefore, that allows the signal to show yellow, as is shown here. One further thing to note is, is that when train controller starts a schedule and sets up a route when it's running automatically, it also starts the train and the train can be moving while the points are still being set in the route. This is okay as by the time the train gets to a set of points they're already in the correct position. However, it sometimes means that the train appears to start against a red signal as the signal logic takes a few seconds to work. I've now moved on to train controller gold and this allows you to put an additional delay when a train starts to allow time for the route to set and for the signalling electronics to work. And for instance, um, if I go to the dispatcher window and we 
um, look at a particular schedule. And we look at the rules for the schedule. Now for start delay, I've added in nine seconds. And what that says in the dialog box is it's the delay in seconds after clearing the track ahead of the train, and in other words, setting up the route, and before setting the train in motion, applied at the beginning of the schedule and after each stop. So this ensures that there's a gap between the route starting to set up and the train actually moving. And it means that um, the signal it allows time for the signal to show the correct aspect before the train actually starts moving. Well, I hope that was interesting for everyone. I appreciate that not many people will have a program like Train Controller, uh, but nevertheless, the, the background to the signals, um, the electronics and how it all works, hopefully it has been uh, interesting for some of you. Uh, let's look at a few examples of this working. In the meantime, thanks for watching and hope to see you next time uh, when I will do a video of the lift out section of the layout.